And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host, joined from New York City, the one and only Bill Donahue from the Catholic League. His new book, Cultural Meltdown, The Secular Roots of Our Moral Crisis, published by Sophia, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Welcome once again to Bookmark, Bill. Always great to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Doug. So another book, Cultural Meltdown, The Secular Roots of Moral Crisis. So what is it about what's going on that prompted you to write this book? Well, almost everybody I speak to, and I don't really speak to too many professors anymore. I, I speak to real people, working class people, and some lawyers and business people. They, they'll say to me, maybe in a local pub, they'll say, listen, Bill, what's going on in our society? Nothing seems to be right. What was right yesterday is wrong today. Everything is topsy-turvy. I don't understand it. I said, well, you know, I am a sociologist, and I'm, I get enough people asking me these kinds of questions. I think I need to dive mm -hmm. into it. So okay. what I'm trying to do is to explain to the average intelligent reader, I'm not, this is not for the professors, though hopefully they'll enjoy it as well, how we got to this crisis, and we are in a crisis. And essentially what I'm saying is this, we have two contrasting irreconcilable visions of man in society. On the one hand, we have the Judeo-Christian understanding. We believe in God, we believe in truth, we believe in human nature, we believe in original sin, we believe in moral absolutes. And on the other side, you have the secular vision. They don't believe in God, they reject truth, they reject human nature, they believe in moral relativism, and they think you can have perfection here on Earth. At some point, one of these visions will triumph. I can, I, I can point to some encouraging and discouraging things that are going on right now, but basically what I'm trying to do is so the average person, not just Catholic, the average person can understand how we got to this point. Because mm -hmm. it always, Doug, it always begins with ideas. And right. that brings us, obviously, to higher education. Is that why you start off with the idea of what makes intellectuals tick? You talk about Hegel talking about his own topsy-turvy world and the idea of what happened and how we kind of moved in many ways from what I remember as a kid growing up, which was still the melting pot image. And then slowly I remember, even in New York City, uh, I remember the mayor at the time talking about, it's not a melting pot anymore, it's a great mosaic. Uh, it's a great mosaic. Things are, you know, as part of the multicultural thing. Where did that come from? Well, it's funny, because we began in, in, in this country's history. I can go back to J. J. Hector St. John de Quivasseur in his letters from American Farmer back in the, the late 18th century. And he, he's the one who came up with the idea of the melting pot. He looked at what's going on in this youthful country called the United States, and he said, people are coming from all over the world, and they're coming together, and they're assimilating. They're actually melting together. Uh, they keep their own heritage to, to a large extent, but they're adopting the new American identity, and that's all fine and good. We want to welcome people from all over the world to come into America and accept our, our cultural norms and values. Mm -hmm. What's happened, beginning in the 1980s, I would say, on the college campuses, you could say the 1960s began with the radicalism, but it was in the 1980s mm -hmm. that multiculturalism took root. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Western civilizations got to go. Right. That was Jesse Jackson in Stanford University in 1988. So instead of teaching that we should respect other cultures, multiculturalism really is a weapon. It's a club to beat down Western civilization and to elevate other cultures and civilizations so we can denigrate our own. Nobody understood this better than Pope Benedict XVI. Mm -hmm. He warned us about what was happening. This was, this was the suicide of the West. He warned us about this, and that's why we have this condition today. You said the secular vision promotes exactly the opposite view of what a Christian view would be. God does not exist. Truth is a mirage. Human nature can be changed. There is no such thing as natural law. There is no moral absolutes. And the idea of original sin is fanciful. And that's so important because I think a lot of people miss that point, that idea of when you lose the idea of original sin, then you get to the person's being born perfectly fine. And it's really a function of society that makes them bad. So if you can make society perfect, well, then people will just naturally do good things. That's exactly right. And that is at the heart of the utopian vision. The people who reject God, people like Marx and, and, and the leftists today, they believe that we can create perfection on, on earth. They believe they are really God. This is the sin of pride in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And every time they've ever tried this, everybody who's ever implemented Marx's ideas 
as they did in uh, under Stalin, as they did under Mao and Pol Pot, all it leads to is a bloodbath. Because those people who don't agree with you then have to be uh, eliminated. So the idea that you can have perfection on earth, listen, we are Catholics, we understand progress. Yes, there can be progress. Perfection is in the afterlife with Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's not here on earth. And beware, people. You might say, well, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, it's not a good idea when it's implemented because they're basically saying now, we have, we are the, the, the uh, progenitors of truth. We know what's, what's right and what's wrong. And if you don't go along with us, well, then you have to perish. That's part of the problem with the so-called revolution. Right, you're right. Their conception of man and society is enormously fluid, you make the point. They conceive of the world simply as a social construct, as we were talking, accordingly there are no constraints. That leads to the part, and you talk about it with transgenderism, that whole idea that people can reimagine themselves. You talk about Anthony Kennedy's, uh, quite honestly, ridiculous statements uh, having to do with the cases in front of the Supreme Court about people creating their own, you know, reality. Yeah. We, we can't create our own reality, and there's only one truth. There are not two truths. I don't have one truth, you have another truth. That's a pernicious idea. That's what Hitler promoted, and that's what they're promoting in the universities. It began in heavy way with the French in the 1960s, with postmodernism, there's no such thing as truth. And it's led to uh, not only blood baths and body bags, but it also leads to thought control. Because if you don't go, uh, agree with them, mm -hmm. you're gonna be punished. And let's face it, We've seen the surveys. It's Christians and other people of faith on college campuses today. They are afraid to speak freely about what they believe. That's why they create free speech zones, places, little spots on the college campus where you can speak freely about abortion, infanticide, or this insanity called gender ideology that you can switch your sexes. Uh, why can't we have open discussions about this in the classroom? The students are afraid of failing, that's why. I mean, they, they, there's, there's a lot of good survey data on this. Now, mm -hmm. if you're on the left, you don't have to be afraid of anything. You can come up with the most insane ideas and it'll be entertained because it's the idea that, well, you have your truth and, and I have my truth. Be wary of this, people, because once you go down this road, they can dispense with you. Right. You, you talk about the idea uh, that many are good people who are involved with this, doing the best to advance knowledge and serve society. but. Many others are strange and dysfunctional, and indeed some seem profoundly unhappy, alienated from society. They're often resentful and angry. And you could see that when you get behind uh, the curtain and you see the people who are doing these posts and doing these screaming things in situations, and you, and you look at it, it's kind of like looking at what happened in the Olympics and the people involved with that, and you say, these people look like they're in, in terrible pain that they have lots of problems going on in their life, but instead of having the ability to call them out and say, well, maybe you need some help, we have to somehow anoint what they're saying. Right, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Doug, because I'm not speaking of all professors, but I, right. I spent many years in the professoriate. And I can tell you, back in 1980, when Ronald Reagan won, he came into work the next day, you think you're in a funeral parlor. Mm -hmm. I've never seen such despondent people in my life. They couldn't believe what had happened. And, 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 and somebody said to me, well, tens of millions of people uh, voted against Reagan. I said, yeah, but tens of million more people voted for him. That's what, that's what a democracy is all about. No, some of the most miserable, unhappy people I have ever met in my life mm -hmm. are, are college professors. I don't say all of them, but too many of them are that way. And you know, let me just say something here about extremists. And I mean this about those on the right as well as the left. I've learned that I can tell when I'm speaking to somebody about ideas, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so let's say well-read person, could be a professor or not. I can tell within five minutes, if I'm dealing with a person who's a radical, who's an extremist, they don't laugh, they don't smile, mm -hmm. there's nothing light about them, they're dark, they're pessimistic, and oh yeah, they, they unless you agree with them, then you're just simply wrong. You can't deal with these people. Now, the average person listening to the show, mm -hmm. thank God, probably doesn't run into too many of them, but take it from me, too many professors are this way. And that's a very dangerous kind of psychological profile that we're dealing with. 
Right, and as you point out, their radical ideas about liberty and equality do not linger in the classroom, certainly not anymore. They lunge into the rest of our society and threaten all of us. Efforts to teach white students they're inherently racist, to encouraging young kids to question whether they are really boys or girls, left-wing ideas have aggressively advanced throughout our civilization. This explains the insanity of our time. Madness has been mainstreamed, leading to this cultural meltdown that you're talking about. Right, and the problem here is the is not the average person. The average person does exercise common sense. I am very disappointed with the ruling class, the decision makers in our society, because overwhelmingly, not just in, in higher education and in Hollywood and places like that, but even in the Joint Chiefs of Staffs, I didn't say the average man or woman in the services, the very people at the top, the healthcare industry, not the average doctor or nurse, the ones who are making the decisions. You see it in, in, in the, the Wall Street. Uh, these people are promoting the critical race theory that white people are, by nature, they are racist and that they are sinners, and that we, we have a right to teach people that you can change your sex. You know, you can't change your sex. We believe in science in the Catholic Church. This is an anti-science view. Certain things are fixed. Human nature doesn't change in history. That's why Adam Smith was so right when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, that if you build a society with a market economy, people will, the, the people who are making goods and services will appeal to their own interests, but the only way they can have their own interests served is by serving the public good. Mm -hmm. That works out well. Once you take the state model of socialism, and that means that the kingpins, the decision makers make all the decisions, you have no market, you have no free will, that's when you wind up with the kind of enslavement that we've seen throughout history. Now, you talk about the idea that one institution that stands in the way of secular triumph is the Catholic Church, which I think is uh, uh, right on, because obviously you, that's why it's always being attacked. Uh, but you also talk about the transition to the Enlightenment, some of those thinkers like Voltaire and Rousseau, and how negative they were, obviously, towards the Church. The reign of terror, the tradition of bashing the Catholic Church was carried on as you, with Marx and Engels, and Nietzsche in 1882, God is dead. According to many historians, this was a turning point in intellectual history. How so? Well, once you believe that, as Nietzsche said, that God is dead, then what, what, who, someone's going to take his place. Now we have a power vacuum. And it's always the intellectuals. Marx said it would be the intellectuals who would teach the proletariat, the urban factory worker, how to destroy capitalism. They always make, make an exception for themselves. And once you go down that road, and I, I want the, the listeners to understand something. I'm not saying that every time you hear an expert on radio or TV that you should be dismissive. I'm not that way. I am saying this. Because a person is an expert, because he or she has alphabet after their name, mm -hmm. PhD or Esquire, whatever, don't be fooled, all right? If somebody is saying something which, which strikes your gut as being wrong, trust your gut. You're not stupid. Some of the wildest ideas, the idea that you can change your sex, which is simply biologically impossible, mm -hmm. are coming from the most well-educated people in the ruling class with the alphabets after their name. Right. Again, don't be dismissive of everybody, but if it strikes you as being inane or insane, then trust your gut. Right. I, th I, I think it may be Chesterton who said something along the lines of, some ideas are so ridiculous, only intellectuals believe them. So it might have been kind of kind of fit into what you're saying there. In the chapter one on clash of cultures, intellectuals tend to regard themselves highly, even when others do not. When they feel underappreciated, they console themselves by looking down on the plebeians. They're very, you know, democratic oriented. They're very f much for the people, except when the people start having their own ideas. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, remember in the 1960s, the left was saying power, for, power to the people? Right. They don't believe in power to the people. They mean power to the elites. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. When I was a college professor, uh, I used to hang around with, with the guys in the janitorial staff, the cooking staff, the working class, because I come from a working class background in New York. And, I, and, and these people, I resonated with them. We'd go for beers after work, very nice. Now, the ones on the left who are always talking about the working class being oppressed and we have to be on their side and they're going to rise up against the capitalists, they never spoke with them. They looked down at them. They, they were the ignorant uh, people. They were the so-called basket of deplorables mm -hmm. that somebody around the president once talked about. Now, no, the disdain, the contempt that the elites have for the people whom they proclaim to be on their side I mean, if you really are in favor of helping black Americans succeed, you must be in favor of school choice. You must give them the opportunity 
to go to a, a school, a private school, a Catholic school, a public school, whatever it is of their choice. And if you deny them that right, don't ever tell me you're on the side of African Americans. You're keeping them in their place. And this is the problem with the elites. They talk a good game, but they never live, live the consequences of their own ideas. Every one of these people send their kids to a private school, a wealthy school, and they'll never allow the average black person to have the same opportunity. Right. In the profile of secularists, you say, who are the people most likely to be secularists? As virtually every survey reveals, young people, liberals, Democrats, are by far the most secular segment of the population. Furthermore, Gallup poll in 2022 found that belief in God has fallen the most in recent years among young people on the left of the political spectrum. There's also been a lot of studies indicating that's also the group that seems to be the most unhappy. They're, yes, that's true. They are the most unhappy. And it's interesting, too, with these well-educated people, I studied who are the people, it's mostly girls, transitioning, wanting to become boys, which they can't, but they try to do that, and they're lousing these kids up psychologically and physiologically. What about their parents? Most of the time, most of the time, the parents are the ones who are the secular mi militants. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in human nature. The data are there. It's not a matter of opinion. And I quote this. I, my book, Cultural Meltdown, is loaded with hundreds of footnotes to have the evidence there. It's not just a matter of, of an opinion or something. It, they are very clearly the ones who are orchestrating this thing. We should be helping these young girls and not submitting them to the knife. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You may, in the clash of cultures, you say the secular or liberal vision is much more individualistic than the religious or the conservative. It's kind of interesting because, in, in one way, it's do your own thing, but it's got to line up with the state. How do they marry those two ideas? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because the ideas of right and wrong in society without the state are what you so called mores. That's learned from the culture, often from religion. You, be, you have ideas of right and wrong. The state comes in and with laws, if they work against the mores or the religious precepts, you're going to have a problem. And that's what the secularists understand. They know the ideas of right and wrong in Western civilization have come from our Judeo-Christian past, from the Ten Commandments, from what Catholics teach, and the like. They're at war with that. But in order for them to succeed, they have to destroy us first. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is this culture war going on they're the ones banning the speech of Christians and Jews. And the fact that in New York City that you see Jews under attack right. uh, is, is something startling to me. I know you're a New Yorker yourself right. originally. Absolutely. And, and this, this is just stunning to me what's happened with the militant secularists. Right. It's, 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 it's outrageous. You say the moral divide is even more interesting when we compare views on abortion and a death penalty. In the Pew survey, only uh, almost 100 percent of atheists, 97 percent, believe abortion should be legal. But the survey taken a year earlier found that two in three atheists, 65 percent, opposed the death penalty. That's an interesting dichotomy there. It is. Well, let's take the, the first one, abortion. You know, it's interesting. Radical gays are very strong in abortion. But why would that be? Well, I have a chapter in the book, chapter uh, three, I think, is called Libertinism, which basically talks about a sexual free for all. If your idea of freedom is to do whatever you want, that ever do you put, to put any substance into your body, to sexually have, have a romp, to just do what you want with anybody, then you have to be against what the Catholic Church teaches. And so that's why they're against that. In terms of the death penalty, what the secularists are saying is that the people who are up for the death penalty have been victimized first by society. Mm -hmm. It's the capitalist working class which made these people turn into serial rapists, they're monsters of some sort. So victimology kicks in there. Nobody has to receive the death penalty because everybody is basically was innocent. They were destroyed by the, the ruling class in society. But yes, you have to have a sexual free fall. Don't take away my rights. But give the condom to the kid in the sixth grade. Right. In the section denying truth, you say the Enlightenment interest in reason, science, and creation of respon responsible liberal values has faded and, and replaced by a decadent postmodernism. Why did it fail, and why was it replaced by postmodernism, and what is that? Well, postmodernists believe that there's no such thing as truth, that it's all a fiction, which what, that's the seedbed of gender ideology, which Pope Francis has called, quite frankly, demonic, and he's right. That's where it all stems from. It, the, it's, it's, it goes back to the 1960s to a large extent. Uh, there's no question about it. In France and other parts of Europe, and certainly in the United States, uh, Germany, these are the, the drivers of the idea that Christianity is oppressive and we have to replace it with the 
a, a liberation kind of a, a theology. They even tried that at, at one point. The idea is to free people from strictures. There should be no boundaries uh, whatsoever. Radical individualism uh, is the best way to go. No, we believe in ordered liberty. The founders believed in ordered liberty. The Catholic Church believes in ordered liberty. You can't be free to do anything you want because then the weak will, will suffer at the hands of the strong. There's got to be some restraints on people, otherwise we're finished. Right, and, and I know you talk about several people like money and Foucault having to do with these things. One of the things I thought was very interesting, you quoted uh, Paul Witts. Uh, about the, the the father issue with many of these intellectuals, I think, which I think crosses gender lines. I think it's both women impacted and men, having to do with this radicalization that comes out of or seeming to be relating to have a problem relating to their father and a problem with authority. Right, and they're against authority. They're not against authoritarianism. I'm mm -hmm. against authoritarianism. You're against authoritarianism. That's a dictatorship. They're against authority. They don't like the father. They don't like the police. They don't like the teacher. They don't like anybody who's making any decisions for them. Uh, they want to put themselves in charge de novo. Again, this is the sin of pride that the Catholic Church talks about. We don't need God. We are self-sufficient ourselves. And anybody who tries to, uh, it, that's why I always say, the three most dreaded words in the English language to these people are thou shalt not. They won't be told by anybody. Mm -hmm. However, as soon as they get into the classroom, as soon as they get into government, they try to tell everybody, try to run your life like right. nobody's business. That's the irony of it. They're, they're ultimate hypocrites. Right. Well, you know, we remember the free speech move, movement in Berkeley out of the right. 60s and stuff. Now, as you point out in the book, uh, the conservative professors are open to having other people come on. The students are open to have other opinions. It's the liberals who don't want to hear the other side. I don't know of a single case, not one, where conservative students have shouted down liberal guest speakers on a campus. I don't know of one. There's no end to the number of conservative speakers who have been shouted down by liberals on college campuses. Right. Real clear opinion poll from 2023 said that Republicans and conservatives, and this is not a conservative outlet, Republicans and conservatives believe in free speech the most, and liberal Democrats are the least tolerant of freedom of speech. Now, so it's not just a matter of opinion. The data are there. That's because they are so sure that they're right. They don't need to explain themselves. And if you disagree with them, they're saying, well, you're promoting disinformation and you need to be, quote, deprogrammed. These are the drivers of thought control. People should be very, people need to find out where this is coming from. It always begins in the university. Well, it sounds, like, it's, sounds like, like the Cultural Revolution uh, from China about yes. uh, re, the re education and what happened in Cambodia. You say in the libertinism uh, chapter, it's astonishing how professional libertines always focus on children. We end up seeing, and then you go on to talk about uh, a situation with drag queens, and, and I guess you quote this uh, drag queen who actually said, uh, what he had to say to parents is worth repeating. I have no idea why you want drag queens to read books to your kids. What in the hell has a drag queen ever done that, that you have so much respect for them and remi admire them so much? I could never figure that out for years. What was the connection between libraries and drag queens? The American Library Association is dominated by left-wing white women. All right? That, again, that's not an opinion. The data are there. They, they're the ones making these kinds of decisions. And you have to wonder, why is it that it's usually mothers and not fathers who are taking these kids to the drag queen shows? And I went back and I researched the person who began this whole idea, and the whole idea is to change ch children, to change their, their thinking, so that they, they can engage in sexual experimentation. Yeah, it's amazing. The number of intellectuals in this country, and, and, and certainly it began in France, mm -hmm. uh, who believe that we should get rid of the taboo of sex between a adult and a child. You have the greatest thinkers in, in, in French history, Simone de Beauvoir mm -hmm. and Sartre and so many of the others, and it built it into this country. Viewers may find this hard to believe, but you can check me out. There's a group called B, capital B, numeric four, capital U, hyphen uh, act. B for you, hyphen act. It's a group of professional psychiatrists, psychologists, mostly from North America and Europe, they believe that we should talk about pedophiles in a more respectful way, right. stop stigmatizing right. them. They are MAPs, minor, attracted, 
persons. Right. And uh, right. so we have to get over that stigmatization. There really is a war on children that's right. going on. Right. And, and, it's, and, and the intellectuals, once again, are the ones who are driving this. Right. It's always amazing when you look at so many of those people and what the left foot call with the same, same kind of situation, obviously Kinsey as well. Uh, let me ask you one question as we come down here, and I know you can't answer it totally, but in Chapter 6, the root cause of our discontent is the allure of socialism. What is that great allure? Historically, uh, you see it doesn't really work right, but everybody seems to always think it wasn't done right. Well, I haven't had the pleasure of, of being a student of Sidney Hook one of the brightest men I ever met in my life. He started as a communist. He wound up basically a conservative, uh, a, a diminutive Jewish guy from Brooklyn. He debated Albert Einstein. He debated everybody. He was a communist, and he changed. And in his book, Out of Step, it's his uh, autobiography, mm -hmm. Sidney Hook said, the problem I made is that I, I judge capitalism by what it did and socialism by what it promised. Mm -hmm. That was comparing apples with oranges. He's talking about the 1930s. Yes, we had a depression. Yes, it looked like capitalism was crashing, the Wall Street and the like. So they looked for alternatives. And he was he was attracted to the lure of socialism. But he made the mistake by, by looking at socialism by what it promised. Mm -hmm. Once he found out what it did, that's where the body count comes in. Sidney Hook, an honest man, changed his mind and he said, no, I can't go along with this idea at all. The United States of America is the champion of freedom. I'm not going to work against it anymore. Do you think that's a, that's a general problem? We have people who get into the idea, but my intentions were good. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the world is full of good intentions, and, 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 and I'm not saying that intentions don't matter. But when you see the empirical evidence that your idea always winds up with body bags, maybe you ought to go back to the drawing board. David Horowitz was brought up in Queens as, as a red diaper baby. His parents were, were communists, and he was a left-winger at Ramparts Magazine and worked against the United States during the Vietnam War. He saw what happened after we got out of Vietnam, and the communists took over, and what they did. He, he became the progenitor of what's called second thoughts. He's right. now a proud conservative defending America. People need to look at the evidence, but you have to be open-minded enough to do that. Well, as a kid, they used to say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So uh, right. take, we don't hear that too much anymore. Thank you so much. Always great to talk with you, Bill Donahue, author of Cultural Meltdown, The Secular Roots of Our Moral Crisis, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. I'm Doug Keck. Thanks for joining us here on Bookmark.